Here are these letter, words from Paul's letter to the first Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 22, found on page 221 in your pew Bible, the New Testament portion. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? Since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks desire wisdom. Let us pray. Lord and God, help us that we might know enough, but mostly that we would know you. Speak through your words. Help us to hear. Amen. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? I don't know if you've ever seen that show on television, but they had questions that come from first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. And to be smarter than a fifth grader, you have to answer all the questions, then you get the prize. Now, I've seen several of those shows, but I've never seen anybody who answered all the questions. So the possibility is we may not be smarter than fifth graders. And we may not have all the answers. I know that as we look at life and religion, we don't always know the answers. I can recall when I was a teenager and I, I heard the minister saying, you've got to read the Bible from beginning to end. You have to read the whole thing. And so I started with Genesis. I made it up to numbers, to all the begats. And then I lost interest, I must confess. It took years and years later before I read the whole thing. But in the very first chapter, the very first verses, I was hit with this question that haunted me. It says, and there was evening and there was morning one day. There was evening and there was morning one day. And I thought, why? Isn't it there's morning and there's evening one day? And through the seven days of creation, it always says there was evening and there was morning. Nobody knew the answer to that one. I asked and all through high school, nobody knew. I got to college, I was a religion minor in college and nobody knew. Finally, I got to seminary and somebody knew. Do you know what the answer is? The Hebrews had a lunar calendar based on the moon. And if you base the calendar on the moon, you start with evening and then morning. That's why Jewish people, their holy day is Friday night through Saturday. Okay, it's because their day starts with the evening. Now see, you've learned something. Now you may be smarter than fifth graders now. Now there's another question that's always bugged me, and that's about the wise men. We call them the wise men. And they were pretty smart, magi. They, they saw this star and they, they came to worship Jesus and they went back by a different route so they didn't get trapped by Herod. But you know what? Are they really that smart? Were they really that wise? They didn't stay, they didn't stay around Jesus, and they didn't come back. Now, if they knew who Jesus was, you'd think they were smart enough to come back. So maybe they were wise, but maybe they were otherwise. We don't know. Now, there are answers, there are questions, there are all these things that, that go on for us. The, the Bible, as, as good as it is, doesn't answer everything because we don't always understand it. Now Paul was writing to the, the church in Corinth. Well, the church in Corinth was in Greece. And the Greeks liked wisdom, debaters, knowledge. And so he was saying to them, look, there's no way to prove that there's a God. There's no debater that's going to convince you. He said the, the, the Greeks want wisdom and the Jews, of course, want a miracle, a sign. And the, the struggle here is that we want proof that there is a God and, and we want it in these particular ways. Make, make a miracle for me, God, or, or prove it to me. And Paul was saying that it's really different from that. Knowing God, understanding God, is apart from wisdom, debate, logic. It's apart from miracle. 
It's a different message. It's a message of specialness, that somehow God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and that the message of the cross, which just defies all understanding, is a message of hope and love. Now, to the people of his time, the cross was an embarrassment. And to talk about a, a God who, who died on the cross just didn't make any sense at all. But Paul says it does make sense. It tells you how much God loves you. This is the message that comes to us through Jesus. Now we have to have a certain amount of intelligence to figure this out. And, and when you look around in our world today, it looks like the kids are getting smarter and smarter. Do, do you know that? Does it seem like you know, your kids and your grandkids seem to know more and more, and they, they know how to operate all these complex machines, and they just seem so smart. And I don't know if it's, it's the water they're drinking or the vitamins they're taking or whatever it is, but they're also harder to deal with because they're so smart. But this seems to happen. It seems that we're increasing in, in knowledge, but it doesn't always increase in dealing with one another in terms of how we live with one another. Now, there are people who are very smart. In fact, I don't know how many of you belong to Mensa. Any, any Mensa members here? Now, there could be. Mensa, Mensa is an organization of people who are at the top 2% of intelligence. And you know, that leaves a lot of us out, but that's OK. Now, I've, I've known several people who are in Mensa. Now, if, if you had the Stanford Binet test and you had it above 130 IQ, you could get in. And, and that's, you know, that's not terrible. And the thing is that these couple of people that I knew were like us, okay? They're, they're the same. Now, sometimes they seem a little bit impractical because the, the wisdom is not always, you know, funneled down into how you live, but it's not the amount of intelligence that you have. That doesn't help us to get closer to God. It does give us some direction, but it's not the guarantee. Some years ago, in 1983, I think it was, a professor from Harvard, Garner, came up with seven intelligences, seven different ways to measure intelligence. Not only logic, the academics, but music, uh, movement, uh, nature. And it was really pretty interesting because the message is that most of us have some intelligence. We have some basic things that are important to us to help us deal with life. The two were late, added later, and the last one, the ninth one, is most recent, and that is a spiritual intelligence, a sense of godliness or spirituality. And this is what Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about a sense of being able to be close to God. And so I think it's important to understand that we use the avenues that God gave us. Maybe, maybe the avenue is logic. We use that. Take us along the journey. If, if it's not the logic, maybe it's one of the other intelligences that you have, to, but you use that. And then you get closer to God to figure out what God wants. So we begin with this avenue of intelligence, and we follow that, and we use it to experience life. We learn from it and we, and we grow through it. It's kind of like when I was a kid. My, one of my chores was to mow the grass. Okay, now we had a big yard and I had a push mower. And it took a lot to mow that grass. And I guess my father took pity on me one summer. And there was a friend of his who was selling a real type power mower. I don't know if you've ever seen that. They're all uh, rotary motors now. But, this was a real type, like the ones you push, and it had a mower on it. So we go out and test it out, and it works pretty nicely. The man showed us how you do it. You push this button, and then you pull that, and then you start it, and then you do this to get it in gear. And then to shut it off, you put your foot up on a little metal cap over the spark plug. OK? Makes sense. It really worked. My father buys the lawnmower, and I'm happy. I'm mowing it. And after the second or third week, I decided to improvise. And my improvisation was that it was kind of awkward to get your foot up on that metal thing above the spark plug. So I took my finger and pushed it on the spark plug. Well, guess what happened? I got a shock. 
I didn't do that again. Okay? So, so we have some knowledge that leads us up to a point, and then we learn something else. And this is what life is about. This is what God is about. This is, this is what being part of God is. It is not some kind of proof that says, boy, if you do this, this, and this, you figure it out. Or if God just works this special miracle that somehow you're going to believe. Belief and God and, and knowing God is using the avenues of intelligence that God has given to us. Whether it's seeing it in a beautiful sunset or in the stars at night or, or, or just figuring out all of the truth that, that seems to be logical in this world. Putting it together and then sharing it together. Because each of us has a different avenue to God. And we learn things differently. And that's what we need to do. We need to, to pursue the path that God has given us and to learn from it and to share with one another. That's why being here is important. Okay, it's, it's not important because God's up there thinking, oh, I'm counting this person, this person. No, it's, it's because together we grow and together we, we, we find things out and we, we move in certain directions and we have this closeness with God. Paul was writing 2,000 years ago to, to people who, who thought if you figure everything out intellectually, then that's the way it is. And he was also writing to people who thought, if I see it with my own eyes and believe it, then, then it's okay. But he was saying there's something else. There's another dimension to God. And that dimension is, is knowing and, and using what God has given us and sharing with one another to learn from the kindness of, of one person and, and the, the sensitivity and the caring of a God that really loves us, that really cares about us. This love doesn't make a lot of sense at times. And yet, this not making sense is the message that God is giving to us. As we journey through Lent, remember the struggle that Paul was having with his church at Corinth. How do you get close to God? How do you figure it out? Okay, it's not logic, although logic helps. It's not miracle, although miracle helps. But it's a personal thing. It's a way of, of opening ourselves to the possibilities of the grandeur and the greatness of God, and particularly the message of God's love to us. God gives us his love. Okay, we don't earn it. He gives it to us. And as he gives that to us, we grow in it. And we grow in it by sharing with one another, by sharing that love, and by giving that love to one another. Paul said, the Greeks want wisdom. The Jews want a sign. But I proclaim to you the message of Christ, the message of God's love. Hear it. Experience it. Live it. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, help us that we might feel your presence with us, that your love may fill us every day, and it may pour through us to all of your children. Amen.